uh, we uh, thought it would be uh, nice to apply the information that we gave, gave uh, thus far in a case. So let's read the case and maybe you have any suggestions. New client is requesting an accounting firm uh, to perform a due diligence investigation, a DDI, for the purchasing of a company. The client, Johnny Cake BV, established in St. Martin, is represented by its director, who is a politician. The director identifies himself through a copy of a passport. It remains unclear who the UBO is. The accounting company accepts the client and starts the investigation. All right, now this, in this case, eh, you first have to establish if the service falls under the scope of the law, as I mentioned before. Here it's a, D, a DDI, what we consider to be an advice, and it's about taking over a company. So the fourth bullet, if you recall, applies. So this case falls under the law. Now that means that you have to uh, apply a customer due diligence, what uh, Lassiz had just uh, explained. Identification is part of the customer due diligence. Question is, has the identification duty been performed properly? What do you think? Anyone? Who has to be identified first in, in this case? Who's the client? Is that the politician? Yeah, it's Johnny Cake. Johnny Cake has to be uh, uh, identified, and as you can see in this case, it has not been. Uh, Laziza also explained how it has to be identified by an excerpt extract of the Chamber of Commerce. Now, if it would be a foreign company, which it is not, it's local, and so it's fairly easy to uh, identify. Uh, let's look at the director. The director is a politician. Uh, did he identify himself correctly? A bit doubtful, eh? because what the text says is that he identifies himself through a copy of a passport. And remember that uh, you, as an accountant, you always have to see the valid, the original document. And you make a passport of, of the copy, eh? and, 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 and that has to be done. You have to see that the passport is valid. You have to verify the identity of the person that uh, identifies himself in front of you. So this is also not completely uh, uh, correct. Uh, third part about uh, identification here in this case is that it remains unclear uh, who the UBO is. How does an ultimate beneficiary uh, owner, uh, who is actually the real owner of the company, uh, how uh, does a UBO have to be uh, uh, identified? Anyone? It's always a natural person, so a UBO always has to be identified in the ways that Lucisa told. Uh, valid passport, identity card, or driver's license. Now, that has not happened here in this case, so no, the identification duty has not been performed properly. Second one is that uh, because of the application of the CDD, hey, you have to do a risk assessment. She explained the risk categories. You look at the client, you look at the product, you look at the transaction, and there are very professional models on the market. But if you look at this simple case, what would be your outcome? Sir, with a red tie, what do you think? Random, yes. Completely uh, random. Oh, the risk is very high. Yeah, it's high. And why is it high? Well, because you have, um, first of all, the UBO, you can identify the person, and also the politician. Yeah, uh, exactly. Those are, the factors. Those, are the, those are the key issues in this case. But remember, if you deal with a politician, it's always high risk. That's because international standard says that a, po a politically exposed person, a PAP, is always considered to be high risk. It's as simple as that. All right, let's continue with the uh, second uh, uh, important uh, subject that I want to discuss is the reporting of unusual uh, transactions. For the uh, accountancy sector, there are six uh, uh, indicators, each with an individual uh, reporting code, and they are divided by four objective indicators and two subjective indicators. The four uh, objective indicators are, are quite clear and simple. They're easier to uh, apply. Uh, if one of them uh, applies, you have to report. It's as simple as that. So it does not need to have uh, a suspicious feeling like the subjective one uh, needs to have. 
An example of the objective indicator is the, the passing of uh, a threshold amount, a certain amount of money. I will show it to you on another slide, and, but that's the big difference between the two uh, <coughs> indicators. The subjective uh, indicators uh, are based, apply on, on the basis of a personal assessment that you have to make as an, uh, as an accountant when you provide your service. So in that situation, you need to have a suspicious feeling and that suspicious feeling uh, can be uh, uh, founded on what we call uh, red flags or typologies, and I will show some of these in the next uh, slide. What is important is that not only executed uh, unusual transactions need to be reported, but also intended. Now, an executed uh, transaction is the case that you provide a, a, a service and you provide that service Completely, you give the client what the client uh, demands, and you get even paid for that. But during the execution, you find out that there are red flags, and you report that executed transaction by using, for example, and the subjective uh, indicator. Um, but the thing can also be that during the execution of the service, you uh, find red flags you have the idea that the intentions of the client are not completely clear, and you execute your uh, customer due diligence, you're extra critical, you ask, client does not want to answer, you ask again, and, and during that process, the, the client or you decide that this service is not going to be executed. That's what we call an intended uh, unusual transaction, and that, that's a transaction that also has to be reported, eh? breaking off of, of the services because of client or your, your own policy blocks that. Now it's also important to, to recall that not reporting when uh, this is uh, due is a violation of the law. Not only the NORUT, Article 11 and 23, say explicit that you need to uh, report unusual transactions, whether objective or subjective, uh, and it's also a violation of the panel code. That could be a uh, consequence. Just keep that in mind. Um, also important to stress that if a uh, transaction is re reported as being unusual, the FRU will always regard this confidential. That means that we will not share that uh, uh, information with uh, third parties, uh, except the public prosecutor's uh, office if such a transaction is considered to be suspicious by the uh, analyst uh, department, and then it is uh, given in the hands of the PPO to uh, continue. All right. Here are the four uh, objective indicators. First one, uh, if there has been uh, a report filed to the police, then it also needs to be filed to the FIU by using that code. Second one is uh, in uh, relation to the sanction de degree. As Lizzie's already mentioned, there are UN sanction lists that are also placed on the website of the FYU. If you deal with a, with a client, CDD applies, you always have to check these lists and see whether that person is uh, placed on this list, and if yes, report it to the FYU. Um, these are the two threshold. Uh, objective indicators. The first one, if you have to perform a service for a client and in that transaction you have a, a, a girale transaction, a wire transfer, or a gyro transaction, maybe in correct English, and that is 500,000 guilders or more, then that needs to be uh, reported uh, to the FYU. And the last one is uh, related to cash payments of 25,000 uh, guilders or more or the equivalent in uh, other cu uh, currencies. So if whether you paid 25,000 for your services in cash or in the transaction, uh, your client is paying third party with such an amount of, of you have to report that. All right. Subjective indicators, there are two. Uh, both need a, a personal uh, assessment. First one, so when the transaction deviates from the profile of the, the client, already mentioned, you have to do customer do, uh, uh, risk assessment, and the risk assessment will result in a, in a risk profile, 
and during the execution of the transaction, you find out that uh, what the client wants deviates from the profile as you have uh, um, uh, assessed, assessed it. So that could be a young person wants to buy uh, expensive uh, items, or the business profile of, of your client is not in accordance with the uh, transaction as asks. All right, the second one is, is the big open norm, as we call it, when the transaction gives, gives the service provider a suspicious feeling that it relates uh, to money laundering or uh, terrorism financing. Yeah? So you have a suspicion that something is fishy, that it's not okay. And then you can use red flags. Now, the, the list of red flags for the accountancy sector is very long. We, we provided in the provision and guidelines a long list. These are only four examples. Uh, uh, inexplicable discrepancies between cash and goods flow, uh, false invoicing, always scoring high in the top 10, uh, payments by client without written agreements, and why is your client doing something without uh, being uh, legally obliged uh, to do so? Negative cash balance, it's, it's also so, uh, one that we, um, that we um, want to give you, and that's placed on that list. All right, um, I think that was what I wanted to share with you about the reporting. I just wonder, are there any questions thus far? What we told, you can do also ask us afterwards, but if not, then I will continue with the second part of the case. All right, Johnny Cake, part two. The accounting firm performs the DDI for the client Johnny Cake BV. For speedy execution, Johnny Cake pays extra. Research shows that the target company has multiple uh, bank accounts in BVI and Anguilla. The DDI also shows unusual payments from unclarified sources. The firm informs client negative about the takeover. Despite the advice of the accounting firm, the client buys the company. Does the transaction have to be reported to the FYU? First, is there any objective indicator in this case? Is there an objective one? Any threshold payments? I don't see them. You can't see if, if people are sanctioned on, on a sanction list. You should check it, eh? but we can't find it in, in this case. And there is no police rep reporting whatsoever. So we have to find it in the subjective indicators. That means checking red flags. Do you notice any red flags in this, this uh, situation as an accountant? Uh, for example, speedy execution of a DDI. Is that common in your branch? All right, so so. Now, it, 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 you should wonder why the client is willing to pay speedy, extra, extra fast. And because this is a serious thing, taking over of a company, and we do not want to uh, make an, 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 an uncareful uh, DDI. Now, yeah. uh, so you should ask for the reason. Um, furthermore, multiple bank accounts in BVI and Aguila. Does that raise a flag? I think so, eh? Yeah, might be. Read some pen about papers recently. Uh, DDI also shows unusual payments from unclarified sources. Does that ring a bell? Also, things to check. So there is something about the client behavior here, and the client is willing to pay extra. And what is also important is that the client, that you give an, a negative advice, and despite the negative advice, the client buys. That's also a bit strange. And why is this strange? Because you give that advice, because you, you do not know what, what, what happened in that target company. Could be that within the target company, there have been acts that cannot bear uh, the, the, the daylight. And by taking over the company, there is being paid for, might be, uh, criminal activities. So again, summarizing. Uh, does the transaction have to be reported to the FIU? You say yes. Okay, the majority says yes. So we report it. Um, the compliance regime consists of these four elements. Uh, first of all, having a written compliance policy and internal procedures. 
Uh, this is basically a document, a manual, um, that uh, describes how your company deals with uh, the obligations uh, it has, how they perform due diligence, how they keep records, um, but most important of all, how they commit to the prevention of money laundering and terrorism financing. Um, the FIU has drawn up a template um, um, to um, to make the, the, the trying up of the document more uh, smoothly, um, which will be probably provided to you um, during the meeting or after the meeting, so um, you can start uh, drawing up the compliance policy for your company. Uh, the second point is appointing a compliance officer. Now, the, the compliance officer is a very important person. Um, this is uh, the person that is uh, central between the company and the FIU. The compliance officer will be uh, the one corresponding with the FIU. He or she will be the one reporting the unusual transactions to the FIU. Um, they will follow training. Um, so it's very important to have an informed uh, compliance officer appointed. The third point is having an ongoing training program for your staff. Um, now, the um, AML CFT um, uh, topic is very dynamic. You can have uh, new trends, new typologies, um, a new legislation. So it's very important for your staff to be updated with the latest uh, in anti-money laundering and counterterrorism financing. So what we say is that they follow a certified training uh, once a year. So it is possible to send all the relevant staff to follow this training, but it is also a possibility to just send the compliance officer to follow the training and let the compliance officer then pass on this information to the relevant staff. Um, the fourth point is that the compliance regime uh, needs to be evaluated every two years by an independent um, a person or organization. Um, at the moment, um, uh, we don't have much suggestions to give with regards to the to companies or persons that perform uh, such evaluations. But in any case, what we do um, suggest, what we do give as a tip is, if you know a person or a company with persons that are academically schooled in finance or uh, um, legal uh, or economics, um, and they, they are able to dive into the subject, uh, look at the legislation, and give an, or perform an independent review of your uh, compliance regime, then uh, it is possible to approach uh, this person or uh, organization. Uh, now the next steps uh, of supervision. Uh, well, uh, we finished uh, the registration uh, for the accountant sector um, uh, some time ago, um, but what I would like to say is that um, if you haven't uh, registered uh, uh, your company um, at FIU uh, yet, please contact us so we can get this um, um, going. Um, today we held the information session, so the next step will be um, the compliance questionnaire. I think uh, tomorrow uh, or Friday we will send uh, an email um, with a link uh, to a compliance questionnaire and you will have some time uh, to uh, read this um, uh, and fill it out and submit it uh, to the FIU. After the compliance questionnaire, we will start scheduling the, the individual meetings, we call them the management meetings, um, with uh, each and every uh, uh, company. And in those meetings, uh, what we do is we go um, into more detail in uh, the, the subjects, the compliance requirements. Um, we ask you questions about uh, your company, your, your services. And then, of course, you can ask us questions also um, uh, about the topic. And in the near future, we are going to uh, start uh, the examinations. Uh, we are going to start with uh, pilot examinations, and, and afterwards we are going to uh, go to the real deal. And now, just to close off, um, I would like to um, highlight some recent uh, events. My colleague uh, mentioned already, uh, for example, the Panama Papers. Um, uh, where you could see um, the establishing of multiple offshore accounts, um, um, complex transactions that are difficult to track, um, unknown beneficiaries, um, and also very recent uh, uh, terrorist activities such as the Brussels attack, uh, which was very devastating. 
um, but uh, what we would like to uh, show it is, is the importance of abiding by anti-money laundering and counterterrorism financing legislation and cooperating uh, with the FIU so we can prevent uh, these events from happening on St. Martin and worldwide. And of course, very important to know is also that if we as a, as a country, as St. Martin, don't abide by these rules, uh, we, we could be blacklisted. And that would also have a negative impact on our economy.